Hello, I'm Barbara Gon Mueller. Welcome to Peace Podcast. This is our 50th episode. We just finished 50 podcasts on peace. Imagine 50 times a year you can listen to us about the peace that you need in your life. It has been said that once you've stepped into your passion, you will know why you were sent here. And I have stepped into my passion for peace. And that's why I do these peace podcasts. Let's take a quick review of some of the peace podcasts that have been inspiring viewers who have sent me emails and how much they appreciated certain podcasts. And let's start with the first one I want to talk about today, because we're going to talk about recovery. Peace podcasts brings you authors, um, people who are working for peace, NGOs. Um, It brings you the people that you need to hear from. So I'm going to talk about Douglas Roach, Recovery, Peace Peace Prospects in the Biden Era. Now, when you think about peace in the Biden Era, we're going to think about something that you may not associate with it, and that is the word joy. Let's listen to Douglas Roach as he describes what he can do for peace and how that doing something for peace brings him joy. Uh, but all that being said, uh, I think that uh, we have to keep our, our eye fixed on the goal. What is the goal? The goal is to live a life of nonviolence and sustainable peace. And the, ag- the United Nations has given us the agenda for that. But that hope, what gives you hope today? Well, of course, I consider hope a verb, uh, not uh, not just a noun. I think that we have to activate uh, instruments uh, that can build the conditions for peace. And uh, if you look at the United Nations, there are some, I don't know, 20 or 25 agencies uh, that cover the uh, gamut of virtually all human activity in development, peacekeeping, and rights, and women's rights, and so on. I mean, it's just a long list. And so um, I find um, hope, uh, and I try to give this to people when I lecture or what I write, uh, I try to give them a hope that is based um, on what we have actually achieved so far. A lot of people are looking for happiness in the world. And uh, of course, uh, I suppose nothing wrong with happiness once you find it, if, if, it, if, it, uh, if you can build your life on, right. on, some, on some happy uh, uh, pillars. But uh, 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 happiness in, in its fullest extent, uh, when, re- when you reach out beyond yourself, um, it reaches a level of joy. And that, and that joy is, um, is a, uh, a manifestation of uh, our human unity and our love that connects us all. And so it takes us to a higher level of living. Well, uh, I wish everyone a happy 75th anniversary of the United Nations and hope that, that, uh, that uh, uh, all the problems of the world that we have notwithstanding, that we can find some joy and peace in one another as we go forward. And now I would like to introduce again, Lisa Broderick. As you know from her podcast, she created Police 2, the number two piece. She believes that police and community can become friends. And as you've been watching the news lately, you see it is a hard job. It's a hard job to bring the police and the community together, but that's her dream. So it's police to peace. She wants to see all police officers learn that they are also peace officers. And with that, they put them on the side of the police car. And the story begins with Lisa talking about how We can create in seven simple steps the peace that we need with our police officers, now called peace officers, and what we can do about it. Let's listen to Lisa Broderick. But I had an idea and I followed a dream. And my idea and dream was this, that we could unite police and the communities they serve around programs that uplift and heal them both. Because if we can do that, then we can get to a place of coexistence where the police as part of civil society are a necessary function, a necessary resource for us when things go bad and where people feel like they're, they, they are, they're enjoying uh, the officers who are in their communities. 
they are uplifted by what the officers do when they are in and around their communities. And I know from my work with so many officers, they want, to, they want community members to feel that way. They want to be part of the community. In many communities, they are, but we've had a very, very tough time recently. So at this point, the country is overflowing with resentment and difficulty related to the police. And I'm just hoping that the work we do at Police to Peace can do something to change that. So in our work with communities in the last many years, we came upon uh, an idea, particularly after the summer, which was so difficult. And clearly, you know, the, the referendum and the, the reconciliation we need to do as a country on race and and uh, c including all of our citizens in how society moves forward is front and center and it's an, on top of mind. And the police are very involved in that. And what I wanted to do was to provide a simple prescription where people could put together something for their community. My dream is that it's not just a couple of departments that we fix or maybe the big cities, and people may not know this, there are 18,000 police departments in this country and 800,000 officers. What we really need to do is provide something for everyone, for little communities and big cities. So here are seven simple steps that any community of any size can do. And I know they work because communities are doing them. We've had these out for a couple of months. So number one, uh, departments really need to know what the community thinks of them. For example, a department in the South right now reached out to us and they're performing a self-review. A self-review is a series of academic surveys that we provide to the community in partnership with our research partner, uh, New York University Beta Gov, where the citizens are surveyed about how they feel about their officers and their community in the department. The officers are surveyed about how they feel about the community members, and the officers are asked how they feel about themselves in their department. It's an extremely important process to know as a baseline where the community is in its feelings, because this is all about feelings and where the officers are. So with that self-review, and by the way, the self-review is free on our website. We work with communities all over the country. We can perform it or the department can perform it themselves. But once that is underway, you want to do one simple thing. You want to form a six-month working task force. Now, this six-month working task force needs to include the stakeholders in your community. It needs to include the mayor's office, the city council, someone from the police or sheriff. And by the way, there are marshals and constables as well. Not everybody has a police or a sheriff, right? You want to include advocacy groups. You want to include the faith community. You want to include aspects of the community who all want a say in how the community is being policed. So you form that task force and hopefully you have three people on it, three of, from the group uh, that I just mentioned, of the stakeholders who would be interested in changing policing. And I thought to myself, what, did I really just see that? What was that? But I knew enough to ask a question, and that is, if not me, who? If not now, when? And so I thought about that idea, and I thought if we really could do just that one simple thing as a start to put peace officer on vehicles around the country. The power that we have inside that may be locked in there until something like the police car runs by you on the beach and you see it and you get that vision. Don't ignore your impulses. If you feel something needs to be done, take the action like Lisa is. Lisa, if we want to find out more about Police to Peace, where would we go? We, are, of course, are on the internet. We are at police, the number two, peace.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. We're on Pinterest, of course all of uplifting pictures of, of people working together in their communities in, in ways that heal them, because that's really what it's all about. When you bring peace to a community, people heal. And now I would like to introduce Celia. I call her Celia, but her name is Scylla Elworthy. Scylla Elworthy wrote the book, Pioneering the Impossible, or The Possible. Her book is about making sure that what you want can be achieved in your lifetime, making the possible and making it possible in your life. She's going to talk about the role of women. She's going to talk about her business plan for peace and bring them all together on her peace podcast. Let's listen to Sila Elworthy. It's terribly important to have a vision of the future. <clears throat> and you mentioned sabotage. Um, so many people now have become 
uh, oriented to the short term, oriented to fake news, oriented to actually disbelieving that there is good in leadership. So it's up to us, those who've had the opportunity to grow through hardship, like you did in, uh, and your parents in Hungary, like my father and mother did emerging out of the First and Second World Wars, and <clears throat> all the experiences we've had since. We've managed to hone our leadership capacities so that we can stand up and take a stand on issues that matter now. What makes a person strong enough to prevent violence? Uh, first of all, that they've faced their own fear. Um, all the greatest and most courageous peace builders that I know all over the world now are those who have actually looked at their demons in the face and, if necessary, talked to their inner critic. We all have an inner critic. I mean, when I talk to big audiences and I say, please raise your hand if you do not have an inner critic, and nobody does. So we all have to face this voice from childhood often that criticizes us at every turn. But I, I, I do believe we need to learn the lessons that this pandemic is trying to teach us. I believe that the pandemic is here because we didn't listen to nature before. Nature sent us floods, we didn't listen. Nature sent us fires, we didn't listen. We didn't do something about the environmental damage we were causing. Now we need to really take those lessons to heart. We need to stop consuming gasoline for a start. We need to send the fossil fuel companies into renewables fast. We need to get uh, a protection for our precious rainforests, the ones that still exist. We need to slow down consumption of everything. I don't know about you, but here in the UK, people have found they've actually been spending much less during the pandemic, during the lockdown. Use those savings to bring about change, not to rush back to the shops. We do not need any more stuff. We have enough stuff in our attics are bursting. You know, stop with the stuff and get with the putting your savings into supporting uh, non-governmental organizations, those that are doing a really fine job. Thank you for joining us again for having us celebrate 50 podcasts. What an accomplishment. Each of the speakers from Douglas Roach to Sila to Lisa all have peace as our priority. Wherever we are, peace is possible. As they have said so often, when you are at peace, the world is at peace. It's how you think, it's how you are. And we need those mentors. Way back when we had a conference and it was called the Invitational. And we wanted to know how to go. And I'm saying we, I was on the board of La Casa de Maria. And they wanted to know how to bring peace and global thinking into our world because we are one world. And we came up after our many, many conferences with a very simple solution. Mentors, mentors are the answer to bringing peace and harmony and understanding of how to create a world that works for all. So with that, we then realized that when you have a mentor, and that's why I started Peace Podcast, to show you the kind of mentors that can inspire you to bring peace into your life because peace brings peace. When you are at peace inside, when you're thinking about the world that works for all, and you're thinking about the peace that you want, it starts inside. When I interviewed the 160 people from the First World Peace Conference, the speakers all said in unison as I began, what does peace mean to you? And they kept saying, peace is a wholeness created by the right relationships with yourself. Peace begins with me and starts with the conversation and the right relationships with your community, the right relationships with your family. Step back a moment and enjoy the 50 podcasts 
created for you on peacepodcast.org. I'm Barbara Gahn Mueller, and I thank you for joining us today. Thank you.